One of the topics we have been working on for quite some time now is a science communication, a topic that is uh, quite important in Switzerland for a couple of years now, and a, top that, uh, a topic that we have seen now really emerging in India over the last two, three years uh, as well, has gained a lot of traction. And as part of these activities, we have been working since the beginning with the National Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, who has a strong science communication focus. And this is why it is my particular pleasure today and honor to host this event together with uh, Professor, Professor Shailesh Nayak, the uh, director of NIAS. Thanks so much, sir, for joining us and for agreeing to moderate today's panel. I also, of course, would like to thank Professor Binoy, who is the face of NIAS science communication uh, arm. In fact, uh, we all have to credit Professor Binoy for coming up with the idea on studying the impact of COVID-19 on science communication. Uh, based on that first Zoom conversation that we had together, we brought more parts together from Switzerland, um, the Swiss Academies for Arts and Sciences, and the Foundation Science and Science and Cité, uh, who's in charge of uh, science communication in Switzerland, uh, and from Boston, our colleagues from Swissnex. And then together with NIAS, we then launched a survey among science communicators across three countries, science journalists, uh, scientists, and science communicators. And today, we're presenting those results to you, results which you can also read about on our interactive website, www.covidsycom.org. And again, you will find the link in the chat uh, just shortly. Um, on the website, we not, not only present the results, uh, but we also give some personal insights from science communicators. We've done some interview podcasts. Uh, we provide some additional resources on articles, reports, blogs related to that topic. And of course, uh, we also provide the data itself, which you can download and make your own analysis. Uh, in a few minutes, I will be presenting to you those uh, results uh, in, a, in a nutshell. But now I would like to give the floor to our Sorry. guest. Yes, uh, uh, there's a Can you just Sorry, thank you so much. Um, he's a professor, um, sorry, Dr. Uh, Ralf Ekne is the ambassador of Switzerland to India and Bhutan. And later on, we will hear Professor Shailesh Nayak, director of uh, NIAS. First, uh, thank you, Ambassador Heckner, for taking the time to join us today. For our audience, a uh, quick introduction. Ambassador Heckner is the ambassador to India since last September. Uh, he comes with uh, over two decades of experience in the Foreign Service, previously as the Swiss ambassador to Kenya, with concurrent accreditation uh, to Burundi, Rwanda, Somalia, and Uganda, uh, and also like he was the permanent representative to the UN office in Nairobi. Before that, he was heading the Crisis Management Center uh, of the Department of Foreign Affairs, and uh, he was also deputy head uh, on the, um, of the United Nations and other international organizations division. He had further postings in Washington and Italy, uh, among others at the headquarters. Ambassador Heckner, thank you so much for joining us. And now the microphone and the screen is yours. Thank you, Sebastian, for your kind introduction. I think it was the first time that I was too quick with unmuting myself. So we have been in this crisis for quite some time. It is a great pleasure to be with you, uh, distinguished professors, doctors, scientists, ladies and gentlemen, and um, to join you uh, on this online event on the impact of COVID-19 on science communication and with that also talking about communication in a, in a crisis. It is great to be with uh, you, Professor Nayak, and um, uh, Professor Binoy from the National Institute of Advanced Studies. It is always important for me as an ambassador to see uh, our two countries connect in this um, respect here, our research institutions working together. Let me touch upon two things shortly. Uh, one is communication in a crisis, and then why today's topic is important for our bilateral relations. Um, as Sebastian said, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I have some experience when it comes to crisis management. For three years, I dealt with um, uh, kidnapping cases, with uh, ships that were burning and buses that uh, uh, had uh, uh, accidents and Swiss uh, people were involved in this. Um, so I have a certain understanding when it comes to crisis management and also crisis communication. And the very last point of each and every crisis management 
uh, meeting was communication. What are we communicating after this meeting? What are we communicating internally? And what are we communicating externally? And what I learned was that a communication has to be clear, clear and straightforward. And it needs to be facts-based. And I think when we talk about facts-based, then we are already uh, talking also about science. So let me elaborate a little bit on, on that. The world of diplomacy is complex and the world of science is uh, complex too. So we have that complexity that we share. And in those complexities that we have, there is a need to avoid misunderstandings between states. We have relations and the communication has to be in a way that misunderstandings can be avoided. So their communication has to be clear. Um, I think we also face the same challenge, diplomats and scientists, when it comes to propaganda, fake news, um, misinformation, but also that complex matters are being portrayed in a simplistic way and um, uh, taken out of context. And there I think we have the same challenge uh, to uh, clarify facts, put things into context and perspective, and explain not only once, but several times the same thing all over again. And why is that so important? Clear and facts-based communication creates trust, because facts are linked to what people perceive as truth. And without trust, you cannot have relations between countries, you cannot have relations between societies or relations between scientists, politics and society. And um, communication in a crisis is so, so critical because in a crisis, people are um, looking for guidance. They, are, they, are, they are try to have something to hold on and uh, that they can trust in. And especially in the COVID crisis, uh, that is an ongoing, long, very long crisis. Uh, keeping the trust of the people, keeping the communication is incredibly important. People are looking towards governments for guidance. They're looking to the scientific community for guidance based on facts and also explanations. They want to understand what is happening. So this bond between politicians, scientists, and society is essential to manage this crisis as good as possible. And not only in one country, but in each and every country. So this bond of trust between politicians, scientists and society is key. And with that, what scientists say, you, the scientific community, the community your communication is of utmost importance to deal with this crisis successfully. And for this reason, I'm very happy to be part and parcel of today's event, which is important as a topic. Now, why is this event important for our bilateral relations? Well, this topic is part and parcel of um, our main pillar, one of our main pillar of our bilateral relations, and that is education, research, and, ed in, and innovation. And um, Sebastian uh, already uh, explained the mission of Swiss the Science Consulate in, in Bangalore um, in, to, to bring the science communities um, together. And for the Swiss government, India is one of the uh, focus countries when it comes to our relations in science and technology worldwide. And today, this event creates exactly what the mission of Swiss Next is, and that is to provide a platform for exchange on topics that are important to both of our communities. So today's event on uh, the impact of COVID-19 and um, science communication will hopefully contribute to strengthen the communication of science in our respective countries, in India and in Switzerland. And I also do hope that this platform and event today will not only help us to deal with communication in this current COVID crisis, but also to deal with communication and then with uh, 
solving the much bigger crisis that is looming on the horizon and that is global warming. So the role of scientists has incredibly increased because of COVID, because of global warming. And I would like to uh, conclude by saying that the Swiss government has put science as a diplomatic and foreign policy priority uh, in its new foreign policy strategy 2020-2024. So here we are, uh, merging diplomacy and science. And for that reason, I was very happy when Sebastian invited me to be with you today. And with that, I would like to hand over to um, either our Master of Ceremony, Sebastian, or, or, or directly to Dr. Nayak. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Heckner, and I will, I will take over from here. Uh, thanks so much for those uh, uh, very insightful and strong uh, words. Um, it is now my pleasure as you introduce uh, to our audience, uh, Dr. Shailesh Nayak. Uh, he has uh, many, uh, a long list of accomplishments and, and appointments, so I'll, I'll shorten it quite a bit uh, in the interest of time, but he's currently the director of the National Institute of Advanced Studies and distinguished scientist in the Ministry of Earth Sciences. Uh, Dr. Shailesh was the chair of the Earth System Science Organization, ESSO, and secretary to the government of India for the Ministry of Earth Sciences between 2008 and 15. And uh, as I mentioned, he had many other appointments, uh, but he was also, for example, the director of the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services in Hyderabad. Uh, Dr. Nayak is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences uh, in uh, Bangalore and the National Academy of Sciences in uh, Allahabad. Uh, Dr. Nayak has published over 150 papers in peer reviewed uh, journals and delivered about 190 invited talks. Uh, in uh, national and international fora. Uh, Dr. Shailesh, this will be your 191st talk. So uh, thank you so much for uh, your avail availability and for uh, joining us today. The screen and microphone is now yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, for a very generous introduction. Uh, very happy to be part of this uh, very important uh, event. And I'm very happy that uh, Ambassador himself has been uh, kind enough to participate grace this occasion and uh, made the very important uh, comments about why the science the communication is very critical. I think this joint work between SpaceX and uh, NIAS is a very important part of uh, overall goal which NIAS has been working to address some of the societal issues. And we have seen that any crisis uh, like this pandemic has brought again the science and technology to the focus. And uh, the normal people who are not concerned about generally by science have been, we have been seen talking about uh, which vaccine is to be taken or not, or clinical trials or therapy and many other things. You know, people started developing a lot of interest in understanding that. Now, if you see this uh, communication during the such crisis, the three things are very important. One is the knowledge about any crisis or a pandemic. And as the pandemic started you know, last year, January, February, there was not sufficient knowledge about it. And people were not knowing, even the scientists themselves, you know, not exactly sure that what the symptoms it would have, how long it will remain, what kind of uh, drugs can be uh, administered. Or absolutely, there was no idea, a lot of trial and error. And this led to, because of absence of knowledge, the response, either from the government, is also a quite different. In different countries, the government uh, responded quite differently. And in India, if you see the there was a very strict uh, lockdown uh, came and probably it was the idea that there is no infrastructure to handle this kind of a pandemic. So the lockdown was used to create that infrastructure, but it also led to a lot of miseries of migrations of labor and all. And essentially it is because the lack of knowledge which we had at that particular time. 
And the third aspect, because the scientists themselves were not very sure, the response of individual human beings also was a kind of a panic. You know, people were also scared and panicked, and there was no way how to convey that what was all about. But as time passed, the scientists, uh, technologists, and many others developed sufficient knowledge and started communicating the response of the government also improved. The vaccine development started. A lot of in India, especially, there was no infrastructure. There was only one lab uh, when we started. Today, it is more than 1,500 labs. So the, this, in this process, today we are much better informed. And I think the whole system, of course, the media plays a very important role. But in India, uh, which is not much talked about, but the major role played by the what we call as the ASHA workers and Anganwadi workers, who are work at the grassroots level. They try to convince, like the very famous case of Dharavi slums, where these workers convince them about the maintaining hygiene, the distance, the wearing masks. So I think we need to see how you can reach to the last person. And in that process, especially in India, the media alone is not always sufficient. We need people on the ground level whom the community trust to get the information. The ambassador also made, uh, mentioned about the trust. And I think this is very important. And I, I know that this survey is extremely useful. And I'm sure uh, that uh, it's not only uh, benefit to India and Switzerland, but I think we need to come together and come up with a recommendation which is global use. And I think because the problems are same everywhere, and I don't think this is the last pandemic which we are facing. Probably we may have faced much more, but I think we would be much better prepared. And I think the role of communication should be that the, all the aspects, the government, the academia, people, all should be well prepared to face any crisis. With these few words, I thank both Savishyan and Vinay to do extremely good survey, and we're looking forward to a brief results by Savishyan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Shailesh. Uh, it's a pleasure again, honored to have you here. Thanks so much for supporting this project. So um, you mentioned the results, I will present them just in a, in, in a few seconds, but first we will do a mini survey now with, with our audience here. And I'd like to ask uh, my colleague to um, publish now the, the poll. So one question we'd like to ask everyone, including our panelists today, uh, will the pandemic strengthen the place of science communication in our society or will polarization and fake news weaken the credibility of scientists and science communicators? And so you have three options. Uh, you can be either an optimist and, and you think it will make it stronger. You can be skeptical and the negative impact of polarization and fake news will prevail. Or you can be Swiss and say, well, let's not get excited here. The effects of the pandemic will be a neutral in the long term. So uh, up to you to now uh, choose your uh, choice here. Okay, so I hope you have voted. Uh, in Switzerland, as we know, uh, we love to vote. So that's why we did this little poll. Uh, now I'd like to present to you uh, the results of our survey uh, again. The survey has been done, uh, we have about 170 science communicators, science journalists, and scientists themselves who answered uh, from three countries, uh, the US, uh, Switzerland, and India. As you can see, most uh, answers came from, from India uh, and more or less equal. I think we had a little bit more science communicators themselves. So people who uh, work in communication departments of universities, research institutions, etc. We had also quite a few science journalists being part of that and researchers who communicate themselves. In fact, one of the first questions we asked uh, our participants is like, how do you communicate? What is your favorite channel of communication? And obviously, uh, social media was, was uh, the 
most preferred uh, channel of communication and most used. And here you see the data for, for Switzerland. Uh, so Twitter for science communicators being the main channel with 80% of them using it uh, on, a, on a very regular basis, if not daily, I believe, uh, then followed by, by LinkedIn or by Facebook first, LinkedIn about the same, and then Instagram sort of catching, uh, catching up. Now, I think the interesting thing is like when you look at India, the data, um, so again, Twitter uh, being the most favorite one with 88%, uh, then Facebook actually being used quite a bit more than in, in Switzerland, 65%. Uh, but then what's really interesting, maybe not so surprising for you here, but is that WhatsApp is also one of the really uh, interesting uh, or really um, prominent channels of communication for science communicators. Uh, Instagram also a little bit catching up there. So uh, one of the, I think, key sort of insights um, that, that, that uh, this study brought was um, one of the trends that we have seen, of course, with, with uh, COVID is just like the skyrocketing of the scientific output uh, related to, to COVID. Um, so there was actually an article in, in Nature, um, around 4% of the world's research output uh, in 2020 was, de was uh, devoted to the coronavirus. Um, depending on, on the different figures, there have been 100 and 200,000 publications on, uh, on, on COVID. Um, and, and really what has been also uh, been observed is that the number of preprints has uh, really uh, increased uh, dramatically. I think there are over 30,000 preprints on, on uh, COVID according to the Nature publication. Um, and, and that of course also then is, is something that for example, journalists Will have to take into account when they write their their articles so um but the question that we ask is like uh, especially also with the preprints uh, etc is there uh, an issue of quality control and uh, the answer that we got especially from uh, scientists is uh, is yes they they think that there is uh, a um, uh, an issue of, of quality control um i think over half of them have answered this and as well the uh, science communicators themselves. So this is something uh, that, that we observed. It doesn't mean actually that the quality has really been uh, any, any less, but this is at least the perception of, uh, of researchers. Uh, also the, the time from, from, the, um, from the draft to, being the, to the publication actually has been reduced uh, rapidly with the peer review being taking only half that time uh, than, than usual, at least in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, then the other question we ask is like to science communicators, like who do you trust the most? And, and this in some sense is not, not really surprising, but in a way, a reconfirmation that um, science communicators, uh, science journalists believe have a lot of trust in researchers and universities uh, themselves, as well as uh, in international authorities. Uh, and by that, uh, I think most of them would be referring to WHO. So these seem to be the, the most credible sources of, of information for science communicators and, uh, and journalists. I think the interesting thing here is, um, again, maybe not, not a huge surprise, but the journalists themselves, so science journalists, uh, do not have that same credibility even among their peers. So even journalists themselves would say that they wouldn't trust as much their colleagues than, of course, the, the trusted source of researchers and universities. Uh, the least trusted, again, influencers, I think nothing surprising. Uh, life science companies also not being considered a, a very trustful source and local public authorities. Again, that is across uh, all three countries, the results were very much as, uh, the same or very similar. Um, one thing um, that, that we saw is, uh, of course, one huge challenge that science communication journalists were facing was really the infodemic uh, that came along with the pandemic. Uh, and so a lot of scientists had to uh, spend time and energy on uh, debunking sort of like fake news, uh, making sure that people do get the right information. Uh, and, and even here in India, I think there was a group of scientists who came together to address uh, this uh, this um, this issue of, of fake news. And this is also reflected uh, as one of the biggest challenges in reporting about the pandemic. Uh, it's uh, misinformation, fake news, but also the uh, politicization of, uh, of scientific information. And I think that's also a bit of a debate we had uh, last week in Switzerland, the, the politicization, instrumentalization uh, of science and, and, and politics. 
And I think when, when we look at, uh, and if you compare the three countries, uh, you can see actually that um, the, the sort of the misinformation uh, is, is somewhat uh, similar between India and Switzerland. Uh, so fake news to, as a challenge um, in, in the US even a little bit more. Uh, if you look at the politicization in Switzerland, it's not, it's not too bad, but 30% think that it's a, a, it's a challenge, a big challenge. Uh, versus in India, it's about 50%. And again, I think in the US, as you can see also in, the, in that heated environment um, that, that we saw last year, 80% uh, again think that politicization is a big issue in terms of for science communication. So where do we go from here? Uh, I really would like to invite you to, to go and visit our website, um, uh, COVID, uh, COVID SciComm. We have structures to support good science communication uh, from our expert in, uh, in the US. Uh, we heard that she's actually uh, now censoring herself and has quit uh, Twitter uh, because she was trolled and uh, is afraid of being drawn into that politicized environment. So some, some really interesting insights that I invite you to, to visit on our website. Um, this is uh, how it starts. So, so we have the, the analysis, we have stories, and as I said, the data that we share with you that you can download and, and do your own analysis. So again, a big thanks to our partners for the study, especially now here present uh, NIAS, but our, also our Swiss partners, uh, the Swiss Academies and Sians and CITE. So with that now, I'm going to stop share the screen and I'd like to now uh, sort of ask our um, speakers of the panel to come on the virtual uh, stage and I'll keep the introduction short, uh, short in, in the interest of time. But first, I would like to introduce and, and welcome Professor Gagandeep Kang. She's the professor of microbiology at the Wellcome Trust Center Laboratory at the Department of Gastrointestinal Sciences at the Christian Medical College, Velour in India. Uh, she's also the first Indian woman to be elected as fellow of the Royal Society in 2019. Welcome so much. Thank you, professor, for joining us. Uh, we also have Dr. Sandhya Kushika, Professor at the Department of Biological Sciences at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai. Uh, she has been very much engaged in community building activities around science communication also on COVID-19. So thank you so much, Professor Kushika, for joining us uh, today. Uh, we have also journalists here, uh, Ms. Uh, Sandhya Ramesh, a senior editor at, uh, at the Science at uh, the, the Print India. Uh, she also has written regularly for leading publications like The Wire, The Hindustan Times, Mint, and The Planetary Society, among others. And she will be given the perspective from a journalist uh, covering COVID-19. And last but not least, we also have a Swiss perspective in this panel with Professor Mike Schaefer, who's Professor of Science Communication at the Department of Communication and Media Research at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, Professor Mike Schaefer has been advising us on the, on the project, um, but he also uh, is the one who is doing the science parameter study in Switzerland. Uh, this is a regular study uh, being done in Switzerland and other European countries on how society uh, in Switzerland feels uh, about, about science, scientists, how they perceive the value of science in, in society. And he actually also done a, a COVID-19 special, uh, which again reflected a bit similar results as we had in terms of the trust in scientists. So with that now, uh, I'd like to hand over to Professor Shailesh to moderate the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, and I welcome a very distinguished panel uh, for the strong discussion which we have on this. Uh, what I will do is uh, I have a one specific question for each uh, panelist, and you can take about a couple of minutes uh, to answer that. After that, there are some common questions for the entire panel. And then we may have some questions from the other audience as well. Uh, so may I ask first question to Professor Helen Deep Khan. Uh, you have seen the, some of the results and the, it was found that the most credible source of information is scientists or researchers, uh, essentially. So in light of this uh, lessons which we learn from the pandemic, is it worthwhile for a scientist to take more active role in respect to policy making and communicating science with society? 
Thank you very much for that question. I think that isn't a question. Obviously, scientists must play a role in communicating with both the public at large, of which we are a part, as well as with policymakers. I think our levels of success vary with the audience and the approaches that we take to science communication. One of the things that particularly worries me is that we have a very vigorous and active debate in the English media. We have a lot of sources of information that are available to people, both local and global sources. But when it comes to the many languages that are spoken in our country, I think the quality of the information and the quantity of the information become very much more restricted. So if we are to think about scientists communicating and communicating clear, credible information from trusted sources, then one thing we have not done well is use the local print media as well as forms of social media to reach out to people who don't necessarily speak English. I think uh, I agree with you. Do you think the academies, science academies, can play a very active role in uh, communicating in regional areas because they are everywhere present? So the academies also have the same problem. All of our science communication by and large tends to happen in English. So unless we make a concerted effort to actually use different languages, it becomes more challenging. I think there are many programs that are being put out on TV and on channels that use a mixture of English and a local language. And sometimes that is successful, but I think it would be really good to see programs that are done purely in a regional language. And maybe Hindi has a hegemony in a sense in India. And I think for many parts of the country, it just doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gajendri. Uh, may I now uh, go to Professor Sandhya Koshika? Uh, the question which I have is, uh, uh, many scientists and policy makers believe that pandemic has brought scientists and communicator communities much closer. What is your stand on this statement? I wish I had, you know, quite the confidence with which you stated it. I think it could be much better. I mean, it often seemed to me in, in the kind of outreach I was doing, and by no means is it extensive enough to make strong conclusions, but um, there is still a gap between the scientists and the communicator. And I think the gap comes in two places. One is the scientist has to effectively communicate what is known and how much, you know, how much you don't know and how well it is known. That automatically becomes an answer which has a lot of caveats. And I often find that communicators, especially if they're journalists, want a simplification which is very hard for the scientist to give. So I think that sort of is, is a process that you need to learn. And that's a process that needs to be established from the beginning. Um, there are obviously some, uh, some journalists and communicators who are exceptionally good at it. Um, but especially what Gagandeep Kang said is something that we have seen ourselves in ISRC. We put out a lot of material in Indian languages. We put out these, uh, you know, put in a lot of effort in training people um, so that, you know, we could be practice things in beforehand and have these call-ins where people could call in and ask questions about the pandemic. But we could not necessarily get the media interested in it so that you could take some of that and convert it into, say, print or other kinds of media so you'd have much wider access to the information. So I think the gap exists. I, I don't think it's a negative. I think things are better, probably, than they have been in the past. I think there's recognition on both sides, but there's a long way to go. And there's a long way to go, especially 
in um, Indian languages. Some places it's easier. I mean, I think like for instance, the Tamil Nadu Science Forum has deep roots in the community. So one, one has that, communicate, uh, that connection. But when you look at something well, you do in Gujarati, you're not able to get that. In fact, some of the things that we did in Hindi had the lowest num amount of uptake in the beginning. So which is kind of surprising to me because Hindi is spoken in such and understood in such large parts of the country. So I think we still have some way to go. And I think that dialogue cannot be restricted to the pandemic. These have to be relationships, just as you need relationship between the person like an ASHA worker and that community. Likewise, you need this dialogue to take place, not just in the context of the pandemic, so that you can use it. In, and there's a relationship where both sides understand what they're trying to get out from that piece of question that they ask you. No, otherwise, they'll just call you and say, in 15 minutes, we want a two minute video where you debunk this. It's a rare scientist who works at that speed. I think you made a very important point that how you can make it very simple. And uh, you also made uh, the use of Asha workers and Tamil Do you think it would be worthwhile to convert, translate in the scientific output into a very simple language, in different languages, you can be said. And uh, we don't have such kind of a platform today, either in print or uh, in uh, social media. Do you think it would be necessary to have, and also for not for pandemic, for general science and technology output for those people. Absolutely. I mean, this is, you know, this is not, I mean, this needs to be done. But I would say, I would go one step further than that. That, you know, yes, you need this translation, you need simple things to be put out. But you also need what I think would be where the grassroots people can speak to people who are, you know, where they can bring their questions. So in COVID, it's easier because, you know, it's all questions related to COVID. And, you know, some scientists have been keeping it the literature. Some people like Professor Kang, who have been doing an admirable job in speaking in so many fora so that the rest of us can also get educated. But you need an ongoing, you, you can't have that restricted to COVID. There are going to be multiple different things which they're going to face. And we need people who, scientists who are willing to invest the time and the mechanisms to link the two where people on the ground have access to the people who can explain things. And I think that would be really nice if it would come out from here. At least that's, I see it as a gap. If you just do it issue-based, you'll have a patchwork quilt solution, which will maybe work here and there, but you would not have something which really addresses the depth and breadth of all of the, all of the communication needs with respect to science. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sandhya. Uh, now I go to Ms. Sandhya Ramesh. Uh, as uh, Sebastian has told that the most of the studies which is published in Nature, uh, you know, that only 4% of research output was devoted to coronavirus. It's quite large. Uh, and almost he also mentioned that 30,000 articles were not peer reviewed. So, at if you see this paper, the results are very sensational in some cases, but many times lacking scientific basis. So how did you balance the need to seek readers' attention and at the same time consider more balanced view for complex scientific data? How do you address both this? Well, uh, that, that's a really interesting question because uh, especially with co the COVID pandemic itself, if you're not a seasoned infectious disease reporter, uh, chances are you found yourself in the situation where there is there are so many sensational findings coming out, but you don't know whether to write about them and how much of it is accurate. So I think this was a lesson that each of us learned um, as time passed by. One is that we first learned to sources, even with preprints, even though there are places like Med Archive and Bio Archive, we narrow down um, the sources that we talk to and the voices that we trust, you know, just like with 
the the survey indicated even journalists themselves of course we trust researchers above um, all other groups of people when it when it comes to the pandemic so um i identified certain voices that i trusted and um everything is great now everything is on twitter so you could get uh, instant feedback about new findings and new papers that came out and then you also you also sort of develop your own uh, intuitive sense of understanding whether something is utterly completely nonsense or if something makes sense there are some very easy filters you can apply for example if something sounds too fantastical to be true then it likely is so those are sort of instincts that i think kick in over a period of time and uh, the process would uh, would be the same as as it is for regular citizens where you identify the sources that you are able to trust and the voices you are able to trust and see what comments they have to make on it and i think also going hand in hand with this is that it is important when writing and reporting about these stories that you do not underestimate your audience so i think it's always important to be honest with the audience with the readers and tell them exactly how much we know and how much we don't know and i think people also do have um their ability to understand how much to trust and what to believe in and i think it's it's usually mistake when we think that if if we confirm if we convey everything 100% to the audience that it might scare the audience or something like that i think uh, it's a combination of all of those those things help over the time yeah i have just one small supplementary question how difficult it was in say last january and today to communicate about the covid what is the difference you can see uh, during these two situations well things have changed a lot over the past year for one there are certainly facts that are well established now i think um in about feb or march of last year we were we were still talking about whether this is going to become a big pandemic how does it spread how much disinfection of surfaces do we need to do and we were still um analyzing all of those um, initial reactions and things are of course much 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 better we understand how the virus spreads we understand what kinds of drugs work and in what manner we understand uh, how so many other all of these vaccines work so i think the game is sort of changed and evolved a little bit um, to do more with logistical problems when it comes to reporting as opposed to newer science itself um so i think that is one of the more remarkable differences that we can see in terms of the subject and the content that we get to write about um but also in general it's it's sort of been very fascinating because as not just a science journalist but also regular citizens who are not deeply involved in academia i think the past one year has given a a good insight into how the scientific process itself works so with that bit of additional context as well i think writing has become much more nuanced nowadays for sure thank you thank you sadia um uh, now we'll have professor mike shafer uh, we had uh, seen about the fake news one uh, presentation on that so did the deluge of uh, information or a misinformation that happened to the pandemic influence the public trust in science or and what would be the best strategies to prevent such uh, infodemic during such disasters in future professor bai thank you very much and thank you also for having me it's very interesting to hear about and learn about uh, uh, the the situation in india and pandemic communication in india i mean in terms of trust in science uh, i think yes of course the deluge of misinformation the, the infodemic as the who has called it has influenced trust in science but not to a degree and in a way that uh, uh, probably many people have feared so if we if we actually look at the numbers that we have on trust in science on trust in individual scientists also to a degree in trust in authorities like the who um and we can look for india at the at the survey that swissnex has done for example and we have data for a couple of other countries as well 
indicating that what we rather see in a situation where many things have been uncertain early on, especially, and where people were looking for uh, to make sense of the situation and seeking certainty and all that, most people actually turn towards the sources we all would probably like them to turn to, which was science and scientists and authorities actually, that, that actually know what they're talking about. So we saw a what political psychologists call a, a rally around the flag effect in many countries, which is a spike in trust in science that has normalized in many countries as well. We see this in Switzerland as well, but that is still above pre-pandemic levels. And that is good news. And it's also good news that many people turn to trustworthy media sources. Uh, so public service broadcasting in Switzerland, I don't know it for, for India, I have to say, but in Switzerland, Public service broadcasting has seen a spike in, in, in audience numbers, for example, and that's all good news. That said, that doesn't mean, of course, that the, the infodemic and the, 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 the amount of mis- and disinformation that's around, and that's especially around in social media and in messengers, like WhatsApp is important in India, for example, which we footnote, which we don't see as well as researchers because it's more difficult for us to actually look into that. Um, that still is a problem and we can't avoid that that easily also in the future, I have to say. So uh, it is a situation that affects many people and where many people want to speak out and seek certainty. And where also, of course, quite a few people seek to further a political agenda or gain a personal advantage of that. So there, there will be these offers, these deviant alternative interpretations they will miss in this information will be out there and it is, has always been out there if you look at studies analyzing this historically during crisis situations and the fact that we have social media where everybody can speak out now catalyzes that in a sense of course what we need is i think in the interview that sebastian has mentioned i, I tried to uh, sketch this this uh, program of a more resilient society on many, and that's a big, a big plan, a big program uh, on many levels. But on a macro level, we need to strengthen science communication. Professor Kushika has, has mentioned many aspects of that. We need to motivate scientists to speak out. We need to actually reward them and valorize it if they actually do it, for example. We need to train them also. Uh, we need them also to listen to what's actually needed in terms of science. It can't be a one-way monologue that we, that we do if we speak as scientists. It has been a dialogue. We need science societies, science policy interfaces, also interfaces that actually are structurally secure and that exist over time. Organizations that actually uh, uh, organize this, these, these exchanges. We have to talk, I'm, I'm speaking too long, I'm sorry, but we have to talk about science journalism, about the role of universities. And on the, just two more senses, uh, sentences on the individual level of, of uh, individual people, we have to A, train them to recognize certain things. We have to, there's research in psychology, very interesting on how to inoculate people, how to vaccinate them in a sense against misinformation and there's ways about how to do that. And we have to give them a, a sense of media and also scientific literacy that helps them navigate information that they encounter and actually figure out well, what's trustworthy and what's not. And the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that many people actually currently listen to science is also provides positive opportunities to actually do that in the mid and long term, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. This one small uh, question again, what you answer. The, the different, uh, the fake news or misinformation, uh, we could see that it is a different level in different countries, uh, where it's quite quick. Now, is the motive of those people who want to circulate such fake news, is more or less same everyone, or there is a difference? Different people have different motives to no, it, it differs from country to country. I mean, the example that many people look at for obvious reasons is the US, where not only do you have a very polarized political system, and, and 
by extension or to some degree also society, uh, but where also the, the system of communication in the country and the system of mediation in the country, the media system, for example, but also uh, social media accounts and, and people uh, or, or influencers that people listen to on social media is also polarized. And, and in that system where previous science related issues like uh, Ambassador Heckner has mentioned global warming, for example, uh, or secondhand smoking or other science related issues have already been treated along this kind of divide between two sides of the American society. I mean, that's a very fertile ground for a lot of this and misinformation. And we see that also, whereas in other countries, you don't have this kind of fertile ground, thankfully. So the degree of this and misinformation is lower. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, the next question I have for the entire panel, the question is, uh, how does social media change your work, either as a communicator or as a scientist? Uh, may I now first ask uh, Professor Sandhya? This has been remarkable. Actually, this is the only social media platform that I regularly use is Twitter, and it has been remarkable. I'm so grateful to the numerous scientists who go out there and explain things, break down preprints. I'm a neurobiologist. I'm not an infectious disease person or a vaccinologist. I mean, sort of an accidental COVID-19 science communicator. And that has been critical. So people in India, Gagandi Kang, um, but uh, also outside, um, Akiko Iwasaki, Eric Topol, there's a whole bunch of people. So, you know, you would read the preprint, but, you know, within 10, 12 hours, there will be a breakdown of that preprint. Um, so I also felt this was really useful way for me. I don't do it as much now as I did it earlier. So where I would be going to spaces because I was aware of them. So it's the National Academy of uh, Medicine in the US. There was there were these webinars which came from Johns Hopkins universities. There were in India, the National Cancer Grid had a series of uh, seminars on COVID-19. And this is not necessarily something which a lay person will go and listen to. And you know, I could take screenshots, I could write one word summaries and put that out. And I thought this is a great way if people wanted to engage. And, and I think that's the positive aspect of social media. And in fact, I've had people who I don't know personally who have said that they follow me on Twitter only because of that. In fact, my Twitter following went up, I think, because I was doing this stuff. So I think it allows people to, to access information, which is usually restricted to smaller groups of people side by side. Of course, there's a lot of misinformation and fake stuff which comes through um, Twitter. And I really appreciate the scientists who spend their time debunking it or countering it. And sometimes those things even come from people who are very critical sources. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And I, I really respect the people from doing that. On the balance, I would say social media has real positives. I don't have that much positive stuff to say for WhatsApp because it's it's somewhere which is which are these tiny little groups which are all with each other there is no way for anybody to get in there and give a counterpoint of view at least with uh, other kinds of social media you can do that so that is that is both good and bad but i would say the good outweighs the bad <laughs> uh, professor mike Social media, I'm, I'm an, I believe I have to be an avid social media user because I'm researching science communication. So I feel like, okay, I have to know how Twitter and TikTok and uh, also more recent social media actually work. So I'm on there and I do this a little bit. Um, and like like Professor Kushika said, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's twofold. On the one hand, I really benefit from it. I also benefit from it because people like me in my research field, science communication researchers, like me, they are very social media uh, uh, focused by now. And they are also on there, which means for me that in a research field that I'm working on that is very interdisciplinary. And that would normally mean that I have to have a look at 60 journals or something like that regularly to actually figure out 
what's coming out of my field, I can shortcut this via social media because many of the people are on there and tell me on social media, look, there's something new I have done and we have this new project, all that. So I really like that. And uh, on the other hand, of course, I see the mis and disinformation. And sometimes my research topics have been, for example, climate change communication was something I'm still working on and have been working on for quite some time. And I, I don't always feel uh, brave enough to, to venture into these discussions, but sometimes I do. And that's, that's not always fun, of course. And I can see that, but I feel it's, it's sometimes necessary to do that, especially maybe this uh, as, as two sentence, especially if I feel like I am speaking to a, let's say a climate change skeptic in front of an audience where actually other people who are not skeptics themselves necessarily can see us so that they actually see, well, there's other positions out there as well. And these other positions kind of make sense too. And are, or maybe I, I won't venture down the wrong path here. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Dear Ramesh. Yes, um, so I think my experiences also echo what uh, both Dr. Uh, Sandhya and Professor Mike said. Uh, I think it is a double-edged sword um, in the sense um, I've received a lot of benefit from social media. I do use Twitter as well, primarily. And I think I, I'm, I'm immensely grateful for um, the kind of people that it has allowed me to connect with and the sheer scope of help it has offered to my work um, but at the same time um, like uh, like Professor Mike was saying that there's also rampant disinformation and misinformation going about and that too as a female journalist often I don't even feel safe saying and opining some things that I would otherwise so I think it's it's a mixture of both and I've always been a vocal proponent of using so social media professionally and to use it well. Once you figure out how that particular tool works, I think it's each, each platform can be tremendously useful to what you want to get out of it. Thank you. Professor Gagetti. So, um... Social media makes me feel tremendously guilty. I, I used to use Facebook, came off that three years ago. Um, recently been doing a little bit with Twitter, but it's always like there is so much to do and there's so little time to do it in. And you know that when you, you put something out there, it reaches an audience, it can be amplified, but it takes a lot of time. And, um, you know, as Sandhya said, really grateful to the people who do a fair bit more of this than I do. I wish I had more time and could do more. Um, what Sandhya Ramesh said about feeling unsafe I think one of the advantages of being older and not really caring is that you can get out there and say what you want to say and hang the consequences. So try to do that a little bit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the last question to our panelists is, with uh, one year into this pandemic, what are your personal lessons learned? We'll start with uh, Sandhya Ramesh. Um, what are my personal lessons learned, is it? Um, so that's a tough one. Um, well, I think uh, speaking as a journalist, I would say what I was saying earlier um, is that sort of giving our audience and readers the benefit of doubt as to whether they really understand something or not. Um, this was something that I think I learned sort of very early on in the pandemics that to not underestimate the audience and the people who are reading the content that you put out um, and sort of trust uh, their judgment as well. And um, I want to say keeping in line with the last question, 
helped us. To, another really good learning is making really effective use of um, social media well. Um, and uh, Twitter, especially, I've, I've gone and created uh, n number of lists this time on Twitter and um, people have been following and I hope people have found it uh, useful as well. So leveraging uh, social media and sort of other these kind of social tools and um, enabling them to work professionally for you. I think that was uh, that was something that many of us learned during the pandemic this time. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mike, uh, may I have your views? Yes, sure. Uh, this, in education science, there's this concept of the teachable moment. A moment when you can, when by sometimes external circumstances, you are forced to stand still for a moment and think about things. And that's actually, that's, that's a concept I like, but that's also what I felt uh, the pandemic did in a sense to me personally, to, to think about a couple of things, including like, I don't know, flying to conferences or, or traveling to a lot of different meetings to places where we actually could have met in the format that I, I would rather have liked to come to Bangalore, of course, but it's I mean, you can do many things in this format as well. And that, that's for me personally, was one of the takeaways from that. And as I, as I hinted upon earlier, I think more, more broadly, I think we are also, it's a teachable moment or it can be a teachable moment for us as societies for how to improve science communication because the importance of science communication and also the, the, the challenges that we have are clear to many people, including decision makers right now. So if we want to build capacities and infrastructures for the long term, now is a good time to do it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Professor Gagendi? So I think for me, what I learned was that I want to do more. So seeing the kinds of issues that we've had in India, I think there are lots of gaps that really need addressing. So. If I have a platform now, I'd like to use that to be able to do more for particularly primary health care in India. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Sandhya? I think the biggest thing which I knew going in instinctively, but I sort of solidified that is people who come and seek out information. They are sometimes even have ideas which are maybe not in line with current scientific thinking, but it's really important to respect and engage with them in a respectful manner. I think you have much better ability to get them to see your point of view if you develop that kind of communication. And you don't agree with them, but I think often if you treat them with respect, it's it really helps the conversation along and you're more open-minded to what you have to say. I think I was very struck by that. I sort of thought it, that would be the case, but it really turned out to be, um, I, I didn't expect it to be, expect that to be as important as it has turned out to be. The other thing which I realized, and here again, I echo what uh, Dr. Uh, Gump said, it's, it's very important that we build structures early on. I can see several gaps. One of the things is really develop in our citizenry, develop close interactions with scientific institutions and the local populace, which is not advertising the science that you do, but really to sort of supplement and develop critical thinking, develop those kinds of tools, which at a time of crisis, people can use well, right? Because they, they would have exposure to these ways of thinking. And then they're not fumbling around the dark. I'm not, I'm not thinking about somebody who maybe can access the Atlantic and eat Ed Young or, uh, you know, or look at Sandy Grains or Twitter. I'm not looking at such people. I'm thinking about the person who drives the taxi and the person who runs the Tirana shop locally, right? Because they have pressures on them. So I think we have to find a way to do that. I don't know how. I don't know how effectively we can do it because I have some understanding of how science communication is done from institutional settings. And it's not targeting these people at all. But in a pandemic, those are the people who need to have that information. Um, not just someone who can, you know, um, have access to many, many sources of information and they just 
it, it's just very different and it's there's lots to be done thank lots you thank you done. very much uh, we can have a couple of questions from the audience uh, yeah uh, <clears throat> question is uh, from bharat kera uh, the question is who reversed that advisory on mask in early phases of pandemic there have been other similar reversals by cdc did this impact trust these organizations uh, may i request uh, sadhya to answer uh, sadhya kaushik Professor. Sorry, it was a bit patchy. Can you just? Uh, yeah, it was uh, WHO reversed the ah, yes, advisory yes, on masks yes, yes, yes. and the early phase of pandemic. So, um, I think the main thing which I would say is, um, I think one of the things that was said early on with respect to masks really applied to surgical masks. But the other thing is people to recognize that this is how science goes. You will have an advisory which is true today. And then as either more information comes in or people have a time to look at older information and reassess, they are, it is going to change. And I think this is again a gap between the scientific community and the general public at large is that this changing place is is something which you should expect and is what is going to happen but people sort of expect that you would have everything figured out this is it and then you know that's not the real time i mean i can't comment on um i can't comment on you know all the discussions which who or the cdc might have had in this regard but I think pretty early on in India, there was a strong push to have masks as early as April of last year. And I felt that that was very well done. You know? And I think at least as a country, we have sort of stood by that very well. From Manoj Varghis, uh, I would request uh, Sandhya Ramesh to answer this question. Uh, it says that Dr. Sandhya rightly said that the journalists want a simple answer from scientists, which is very complicated task at the scientist end. How can we bridge that gap? Well, get more science journalists. I think that's a simple answer. Um, so yes, I I understand both parties here when when we're talking about non-science journalists who often do attempt to do science, um, which of course will be the case if if I try and cover some deep political or military issues as well, that I do not understand that the journalist does need the scientist to explain it to them in the right context because your job, job as a journalist is to gain a proper understanding and then in turn to understand it, um, uh, to explain it to other people so that they understand it. Um, so I think the only way to actually bridge a gap here, one is of course in general before going to interviews and things like that is for the journalist to do their homework. And the other is, uh, um, I mean, I'm sorry, it's a simplistic answer, but it is to get more science journalists who are invested in the scientific method, who understand it, who are able to um, gather enough subject matter knowledge on their own to through their own work and have the ability to understand it as well. I think eventually in the longer term, that will be the way to go about it. And I think um, for, um, I mean, for, for immediate situations, it's the journalist just has to do their homework and ask more pointed questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I very wholeheartedly thank all the panelists for very, very active interaction. And uh, now I hand over back to Sebastian to take the program ahead. Thanks so much, Professor, and thank you all the, all the panelists uh, for, for your very uh, precious uh, insights. We're a little bit late, so I, I will keep it very short. Uh, if this was a, a physical event, you would now enjoy some flowers and Swiss chocolate. But so I'm sending some virtual Swiss chocolate. Um, but I hope the next time we can, we can meet in person and then we'll, we'll catch that up. Uh, big thanks to you. I, I think 
Uh, we can now quickly um, show actually the results of the mini poll we did in the beginning of this uh, event before I will hand over to Professor Binoy for, for his final word. Uh, if we could just to show the... Um, so very nice to see that uh, we have a lot of optimists in, in, our, uh, in, in our audience. I think 68% think that the crisis will make science communication only uh, stronger. You, you're actually more optimist than Swiss people. Swiss people only 50%. Um, so thanks so much, Solomon. I think we can, we can close it. Um, I, I think one parallel that I saw as well, maybe what, what uh, Sanyara mentioned at the end, more science journalists, more resources for science journalists. And uh, there was exact same sort of ask in Switzerland. So uh, we see that there, there are some uh, very nice similarities. Uh, and I hope really that the pandemic will then lead to, to more investment into science communication and science journalism. So with that, I would like to hand over to Professor Binoy for, for short, uh, a short final word. And thanks so much for everyone for joining, especially Ambassador Hector and Professor um, Shailesh. And uh, Binoy, the floor or the screen is yours. Uh, we, we can't hear you, Binoy. We, we cannot hear you. And now it's good. Okay. Yeah. So thank you, Sebastian, for the uh, Sebastian for the nice words about the program. Now we are moving to the final phase of today's program. Uh, like you know, every good program also has to face the end. So it was nice discussing a lot of uh, interesting topics connected to communicating science in the crisis, and it was a great learning opportunity for all of us to learn directly from the luminaries from the field of science communication and policy making. So I will be quickly uh, expressing the word of thanks. Uh, first of all, I thank Ambassador uh, Dr. Ralph Fettner for accepting our invitation and finding time in his busy schedule to attend the event and uh, give the interactive remarks. Thank you very much, sir, for your support. Next, uh, Professor Shailesh Shnaik, Director of NIAS, who is an inspiration for us, Whenever we contacted him with this plan, he was very happy and till date we are getting his constant support. Thank you, sir, for your support as well as moderating the event. Now the panelists. So Professor Grimdeep Kank, Dr. Sandhya Koshira, Dr. Sandhya Ramesh, Professor Mai Schaefer, all these busy people found their time to enrich our experience uh, from our so on behalf of organizers partner institutions and participants, I thank all of them for finding time to share their experience with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, a brief thanks for the team for its side home. You start with Sebastian. So this is saying, if you have a good leader, trust that you won the war before it starts. And we were lucky to have the best with us. So thank you, Sebastian, for enthusiasm, your efforts, which made this survey and event possible. The core team members join us. Anju, Lionel are also thanked for their support. Another team member requires special thanks is Vidya Kamarish. Thank you, Vidya, for the effort and the time you spent on this event and survey, which made this event a grand success. So on behalf of the team COVID SciCom, I thank Tobias for helping us with the data analysis. Uh, and our collaborators, Claudia Oppenhenser from Swiss Academy of Science, Philip Bukart from Science City and Kiana Stampley, again from Science at City. So the support is given by SwissNex India, Boston, SwissNex Boston, National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore, Swiss Academies of Arts and Science, and Science at City, and SwissIP are also remembered with gratitude. Last but not least, the participant of today's event. You know, in this deluge of uh, online events, thank you very much for finding time to attend the event and asking very interesting questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a very good evening.